As Toni Morrison has put it, the destiny of the 21st century will be shaped by the possibility or collapse of a shareable world. Welcome to our podcast, where we explore the history, theory, and practice of democratic socialism with our guide, Big Mike. What can we learn from the past to help us create a better, more shareable world in the future? Okay, I think I'm ready. Are you ready? I think I'm ready. Welcome know. back, everybody, to a shareable world. We are, you You have something in mind, um, which I'm just going to learn about live, but it's kind of a, a little bit of a step back to a more theoretical well, perspective. Well, I think last time we were talking about revolution. Yes. And I tried to make the point, I don't know if I made it successfully, but I tried to make the point that what a revolution really is, is an interruption. Mm-hmm. Uh, so an, an interruption belonging to the same category of phenomena that someone like Peter Thiel talks about when they talk, or and, and his ilk, when they, when they talk about uh, destroying or disrupting the... Mm. the uh, standard way in which we do things uh, in order to release creativity. The whole point that they make, after all, is in order to release yes. creativity. Move fast and break things. Move fast and break things, exactly, which we have a, had a tremendous amount of experience with now in the last few years. A lot of things got broken. What? A lot of things got broken. A lot broken. of things got broken. And, <laughs> you know, like Humpty Dumpty, it's not <laughs> necessarily the case that they'll never be put back together the right way again. Well, uh, the, what I was trying to get at last time was that this that a revolution is a is a is a is an interruption. It's a uh, a break in the in the in the flow of things. So the, the the question that one then has to ask is, well, what is this thing that it is a break in the flow of? And I want to argue that it is a break in the flow of history. Uh, in a very particular way. And I'm, now I have, to, that, this whole point was that I want to say a few words about history yeah. um, in, this, in this kind of context. It, it occurs to me, for example, uh, that, you know, the French Revolution looms extraordinarily large in our minds or in the minds of those of us who consider ourselves to be people of the left. The revolution looms extraordinarily like the French Revolution. Um, not quite would the romance say that the Spartacus slave revolt in Rome had, but nevertheless with a, with a far greater amount of power. And what is the most important characteristic of the French Revolution is that it, ca- it, it fractured, it disrupted reality as it was understood by everybody up to the moment the revolution took place. Mm-hmm. Now, in this perspective, the idea of revolution may refer to a, the concept revolution may refer to a very rapid phenomenon that lasts 10 days or a year or four years, or it may last, it may refer to a technological revolution that lasts a generation. But the crucial point is that it disrupts the expectations about reality that people up to the moment the revolution becomes a matter of awareness because some revolutions don't become, they they take place, but you're not aware of them until they reach a certain density. Right. Um, So what is this? And well, so if I could just, for people who have a very vague image of the French revolution, those disruptions are, are political, religious, so they're they're almost everything. The French yeah. Revolution, I think that's a good point. The French Revolution really was, uh, as was the Russian Revolution and the Chinese Revolution, those are the three great revolutions of the modern age. French Revolution was a disruption in everything. It, it was a disruption of the traditional political system. They not only threw out the king, they beheaded him. That's mm. quite a disruption <laughs> yes. when you think about it. Uh, it was um, 
a tremendous disruption of religious expectations because if the French revolutionaries had any kind of what we might think of as faith at all, it was a kind of pantheism, a kind of recognition that uh, where, that you know God was in nature and everywhere. It certainly was not a the kind of deistic revolution, mm -hmm. deistic belief that Christianity, particularly Roman Catholic Christianity, would have had. It was a social revolution because it brought to power uh, a new class, and that new class, which, uh, which is what we roughly call the middle class, may in its upper more uh, richer, uh, in its upper richer uh, elements, dressed more like aristocrats than like lower middle class bakers in Paris. Nonetheless, uh, they were not aristocrats who inherited their uh, their wealth in land along with um, all the other accoutrements of right. hierarchical power yeah. that was characteristic of the feudal period, which was on its way out, the French Revolution being the revolution that, that puts Phineas to the pre-modern feudal period, if you will. So, they're, they're really, and they, by the way, another element which, which people are now beginning to uh, write about is it was also a technological revolution, which is to say that, uh, that some kinds of technology, not just the guillotine, yeah. which was a very important <laughs> technological development, but some kinds of technology also contributed to the possibility of, of the revolution. Um, so it really was what, totally, like what, are, what are examples of that? Well, different kinds the use different kinds of guns that could be made uh, okay. cheaply enough for people to use. Um, for example, uh, forms of communication which mm. which are uh, not technology in our sense of the term, but but um, certainly are technology in a more traditional world. So. This disruption, this thing that is disrupted, as I said, is, is, is history. Now, this, this is an extremely, in my mind, an extremely important issue, the question of understanding history from this particular perspective. Most bourgeois capitalist historians, that is to say the school of historians that certainly dominates uh, the American scene today, uh, have, in my opinion, a very particular view of history that is characteristic of this age. And it's a field which is populated by events. And while I'm, I'm simplifying, but I don't think deforming, uh, by and large, I think that, that uh, most modern bourgeois historians look at events and try to understand what makes an event possible and what its relation to other events may be. But one of the things that modern bourgeois historians by and large do is, first of all, is to the idea of a theory of history. Mm. Uh, the bourgeoisie, in fact, must deny the existence of a theory of history. It sees events and it sees um, the relationships between events, personalities, etc. Uh, but the idea of a theory of history that describes history itself, that is an attempt to describe, if you will, the laws and purpose of history, is, uh, is not part of the thinking of the bourgeoisie. And I think um, that's an incredibly important point. The reason for that, in my opinion, is that the, bourgeois, the bourgeoisie has to insist on its legitimacy as the dominant class, not by virtue of power, but by virtue of its very being. This is the way the world is. This is the way the world always was. And this is the way the world always will be with some minor shifts yeah. here and there, a little bit of democratization here, a little bit of equalization of income over there. But by and large, we have always had private property. We have always had a middle class. Um, 
this all rests to a certain extent on a necessary confusion between the market and the marketplace. There have always been marketplaces, and we find marketplaces even in um, in, in in prehistoric, meaning pre 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 literate societies. For example, there was a form of trade in in Siberia called silent trade, where you, know, you are in one tribe and I'm in another tribe, and I have uh, fur pelts that you probably want to have to keep warm, but I want your fish. But we don't want to talk to each other. I mean, you're the enemy. You're probably not quite human, uh -huh. right? just as I'm not quite human to you. So we don't want to talk to each other, but we need to trade. So there's that tree there in the forest, which has some wonderful limbs that, are, that make it stand out. And I come there in the darkness of the pre-morning, pre-dawn, and I leave a pile of pelts there. And then I go hide in the forest. And... Um, and in, a, in about an hour or two, you show up with yeah. a couple of baskets of fish, and you take some of the pills and you leave the fish. That's a market. It's very but, different from Black Friday. It's very different. <laughs> <laughs> but that's a market, right? Yeah. And it's a, it's called silent trade because we don't want to talk to each other. We're, hmm. we're afraid of each other, but we have to trade. Um, that's different from the market. Yeah. That's different from the capitalist market. So marketplaces have always existed. But the market as a as the primary economic mechanism of society has an historical existence. It hasn't always existed and won't always exist in the future. In the Middle Ages, for example, in uh, Europe, the church had a very strong idea about what the just price, now the just price, the, the price at which good a good should be traded for another good, was not a matter of market. It was a matter of morality, of ethics. And it, it, mm. the idea was that people should be able to purchase things to keep themselves alive, a kind of sustaining form of trade, sustenance form of trade. But the church had, felt it had the responsibility to maintain that. And if you got out of bounds with that, that was a bad idea. So, uh, you know, people out of greed, not because of the market, but just out of sheer greed. Yeah. You know, here I am a pauper and someone comes along with a loaf of bread and they're going to take more than, than, than they probably ought to take. And, and uh, the church would step in. Their paintings would show this. Huh. They show marketplaces with the steeple of the church and the local bishop in the church overwhelming the marketplace. It's not a, the perspective is, is one of, of demonstrating the power of the church in the marketplace. Right. Uh, but that's not the market. The market is an historical phenomenon. It's an event. Mm. But, but the bourgeois class cannot accept that from the bourgeois point of view. The market has to always have existed and must always exist in the future, no matter how it might be regulated. Right? Yeah. So if it's always existed, there's no, the only history you have is the history of regulation. You don't have the history mm. of the market itself. I see. And that's an extremely important thing to think about. Uh, Hegel, who is perhaps the first modern <clears throat> philosopher of history, and perhaps the greatest philosopher of history, uh, he posits a world in which, leaving aside his idealism, but a world in which history is teleological. It has an objective, and that objective is the return of... I don't want to use this word, it sounds too Marxist, but this return of alienated man to the to unity with the Godhead. That when at the end of the dialectic of mind, of spirit. In history, yeah. History comes to an end. And right. that's going to be very important when we talk about Marxist theory yeah. at, at a certain point. Um, in the late in the late 1980s, Francis Fukuyama. A Hegelian comes along with this idea that history will come to an end because communism has been defeated and American capitalism is, is successful. And what that meant was that he accepts this idea that history, unconsciously, I don't think he that accepts the idea that history is a history of, of, uh, of class consciousness or what have you, class, class conflict. Yeah, and eventually history will come to an end with the victory of American capitalism. And from then on, it's administration. Uh -huh. Politics comes to an end, the end of politics. History is about politics. When politics comes to an end, 
we no longer have history. We now have administration. We yeah. no longer have politics. That's, but that that administration idea is the continuation of the bourgeois idea of managing the distribution of things according to the market. That yeah. is to say, according to a disembodied natural phenomenon. Remember that that for the bourgeoisie, the market is a natural phenomenon, which sometimes doesn't work just like a river may overflow its banks. So you have to shepherd it back, the waters back into the into the riverbed. So you have to help the market go. But the market exists independently, <coughs> ahistorically, one could say. Right, I see. The socialist comes along and says, no, we, we, we think exactly the opposite of that. And the socialist insists upon the existence of a philosophy of history, a, a system of thought which says there are what what some people like Marx call laws, but not laws in the prescriptive, but rather laws in the descriptive sense of the term. That is to say, there are laws which we can discern from examining history, which overall tell us how history functions. What are the contending forces at any given moment in history? They are structures which differ in their content from slave society to feudal society to modern capitalism. But the, the content may differ, but the structure of relationships remains the same. History is about power relationships. And whether it was slave owner and slave, feudal lord and serf, capitalist and worker, the structures remain the same. The content changes. So we can then look at history and have a template and say, let's look at any given period of time. And we can, using these laws as a kind of guide, this is what a theory is. The word theory comes from a, uh, one etymology is it comes from the Greek for picture, for it's a mm. kind of image that you abstract. It's not the thing itself, it's an abstraction of the thing. Um, is we can use these laws to examine any period of history and discern what makes that period run, what makes it function. Yeah. So that's a very important uh, element to keep in mind, and I think it distinguishes the socialist view of history from the capitalist view of history very sharply. Another thing that distinguishes the socialist view of history from the capitalist view of history is that the socialist view of history posits not a, a, a future state of utopia. That's, that's a sub-school and, and, and probably one that's quite dangerous to pursue, uh, judging from recent experience. But it does posit a certain trend which we are called upon to pursue. So, you know, in, in, in the early days of the 19th century, in the early 19th century, the idea of progress, before we in the 20th century, late 20th century, we lost the idea of progress, partly because it was overwhelmed by the looming uh, environmental crisis, the, the elements on which progress was based, economic expansion, economic growth, the greater and greater conquest of natural um, uh, fuel supplies and so forth and so on, all those things that are very worrisome to us now. And so we began to doubt the idea of progress. But but until the, until really relatively recently, it was commonplace to assume that history was a history of progress, which is to say that each generation would do better than the past generation. It would learn how to solve problems more easily. And while there may be no end to history, at least we can look forward to a a, an improvement in the human condition. Mm -hmm. Sometimes some of the experiments that improving the human condition went awry. Uh, some of them are successful. Some of them were acceptable at some time, and like eugenics were acceptable at some time, and then after World War II was obviously um, thrown out of the window for, for, for clear reasons. Uh, but there was a, a belief that history even if it had no end, at least had a general line of movement, and that movement was up and progressive. Uh -huh. Today we don't have that anymore, and we're, I think in the bourgeois world, we're 
kind of floundering trying to figure out mm -hmm. uh, what it's all what it all has to do with. So I think that's the socialist still argues that while given the reality of the material world that we inhabit uh, and of the looming ecological crisis, we can no longer expect that progress per se is descriptive of the path that history will take. We can still talk about justice so that whereas the bourgeois historian may be interested in justice as a topic of historical study, so I could do a study of the decisions of the Supreme Court and right. see how that worked to improve the, the condition of the blacks. Uh, but from the point of view of the socialist, history itself has as one of its absolute necessities is the overcoming more and more of inequality and the establishment of principles of justice and equality to govern the relationships between human beings and human beings. Yeah. And now we could also add into that because it's part of our present ethos, judge, uh, from, uh, governing the relationships yeah. between human beings and nature. Yeah. You know, I, I was thinking the other day, what do we mean by ecological justice? Now young people are using the expression, we, we want ecological justice. Well, what they have to mean by that is that the same principle of, of equality and and uh, a leveling of the field of power uh, differential uh, also has to govern our relationship with nature. We have to pay due honor to nature just right. as we do to each right. other, right? right? So the socialist historian would argue still that history has not an end, but it certainly has a definite trend which is built into the very concept of history itself for the socialist. Yeah, so... I have some questions. And let me add one yes. more point. Yeah. All right, just to complicate sure. it a little bit further. For the socialist historian, in my opinion, history is not just some act you perform in a library. History, the socialist history, the so socialist history is also a practice. It's a praxis. So that, and and this is a, a, extremely important. In the bourgeois world, it's very customary for historians to speak about objectivity. Mm. And that objectivity is born, in my opinion, philosophically, from this idea of, quote, the marketplace of ideas, as if all ideas could be evaluated through the market mechanism. Mm -hmm. That's number one, which I would call into, which I would doubt very severely. And I don't believe it even exists. I think it's a fiction of our imagination, and we should... It's a part of the capitalist ideology. We should come back to that. But I think also that if indeed what history is is simply events or people or movements and the relationships between them, but there are no descriptive laws that, that can tell us what to look for and so forth. There is no real theory of history from the bourgeois point of view. Then you cannot use that theory of history as praxis. There's no way of using history mm. as a praxis in itself. From the point of view of the socialist, what I do with history is a praxis. The kind of history I write, the way I, the, the way I analyze events, the way I evaluate personalities, all involves the idea that history's purpose is to move us ahead, to, to outline, as it were, the path towards, let's, let's call it justice for this morning's purpose, um, to move us to a more just world. Uh -huh. So that history is itself a praxis. <clears throat> history, I study history of the past to know how to move to the future right. in the direction that I, as a socialist, believe yeah. we have to move, which is yeah. to greater justice. Yes. Uh, well, so I've been keeping track of my questions and maybe, maybe just working backwards from your last point. So um, praxis, to use a, a, a more everyday term, so you're saying that doing history, acknowledging that doing history affects history. Yes. Yeah, doing uh, history affects the future. Yeah, absolutely. And absolutely. Then, so from a socialist point of view. Yes, absolutely. And then so from the bourgeois historian point of view, 
doing history is just some kind of account of the past. No, well, the that, purpose of history, the purpose of the practice of history, yes, let me use that yeah. expression. The purpose of the practice of history in bourgeois society is to produce knowledge about the past. All of our disciplines are mechanisms for the production of knowledge about something. Yes. So the historian is producing knowledge about the past. That's the product of the uh, of the historian's uh -huh. activity. Um, but what kind of knowledge is it producing, and what is the purpose of that knowledge? <clears throat> Most bourgeois historians, and I think I would include myself in this group, I, I, I take that back. <laughs> now, that I include myself in as a bourgeois okay. historian, I completely okay. accept. I'm just thinking that most of them wouldn't accept what I'm going to say. No. Um, I think that the uh, the best uh, raison d'etre for an historian is that it's lots of fun. <laughs> right, sure. Right? That from the bourgeois point of view, it's fun. Yeah. I enjoy doing what I'm doing. Yeah. I enjoy telling students stories. And I enjoy getting students to think about problems the way I think about them as a bourgeois historian, uh -huh. right? Um, but since the market ultimately will determine what the value of these stories and the knowledge I produce is, I myself uh, have to maintain a certain kind of objectivity. It, 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 a curious parallel suggests itself so suddenly in my head that... that um, just as the merchant should not put his finger on the scale when weighing out how much bread or wheat or whatever to sell you, so the historian can't put his or her finger on the scale yeah. saying that this is true and that's false. You better believe that and don't believe that. We have to be, quote, objective, unquote. Uh -huh. But objectivity can only be about what exists. You cannot be objective about what doesn't yet exist. So that objectivity is necessarily a characteristic of a kind of history writing that does not necessarily project a future, but only a past. The moment I say, well, wait a minute, I'm very interested in the future, and what I do has to move us ahead towards greater justice, and I can establish a scale of justice, and I can say that the, the degree to which human beings have power over other human beings is the measure of injustice. Yeah. Right? So that um, uh, as, as the new republicanism, which is being pursued by people like Phil Pettit at Princeton <laughs> argue, that uh, a true democracy or a truly just society would be one in which, in which human beings cannot exert power over other human beings. They can arrive at communal decisions through concerting their opinions, but I cannot actually dictate to you mm -hmm. what I'm doing. That has profound implications when you think about it, yeah. right? So for the social historian, there is a future that I want to reach, but that future doesn't really exist for the, for the yeah. bourgeois historian. So I think that's right. the crucial difference. Which then also, you're saying, guides your investigation of the past. Uh, absolutely. In, but absolutely. In, a, in, in the fair sense that you don't make any outrageous claims about or unfactual claims about the past. But no, no, yeah. one mustn't. After yeah, all, right. you can go into the battlefield, if you will, with fake plans <laughs> and lose the battle. <laughs> right. You know, one of, a, a, a sure way to lose the battle is to produce facts that aren't true, etc. But yeah. in telling a story, histor history is about telling yes. a story. Yeah. In telling a story, I can tell a story which will suggest to you what the ob object is, or I can just tell you the story as it is. I mean, you know, yeah. Does the story of the three bears have a moral or not? Yeah. For me, history has a moral in that it points to the future and says we need to create a more just society. Yeah. yeah. So then, on for to talk a little bit more about the bourgeois historian or the current discipline of of history in large in a kind of idealized form. Right? Yeah. No, right. no given historian. Yeah, yeah. Right. Um, but as it relates to this question, there is a kind of. Um, how about I put it this way? There's a kind of agnosticism about the future, but in that very agnosticism, it is per, it is inclined to perpetuate current conditions. Does that make sense? Or do do do, do bourgeois historians just n not have a story about where things should head? 
Yeah, I don't think they do have a story about where things should. I think most, given academic historians tend to be but are not completely as a group progressive, you have conservative historians. Um, you have, as I mentioned last time, I think, you have a, a school of thought emerging that says the French Revolution was a bad thing. It didn't have to happen and it shouldn't have happened. Uh, Russian Revolution shouldn't have happened. Mm. Um, so you have conservative historians who who dis, who don't want the kind of disrupt, disruption that revolutions are, and they are going to look at history and suggest that there are excesses, which of course there are, excesses of injustice and so forth. Um by and large, historians are in the academic world in America, liberal. They'd like a better world. But I don't think they see the writing of history itself as an act engaged in bringing about a better world. Right. But they or, do, they do, like, so for example, go back to something you said earlier. For them, you said earlier, the market as something ahistorical. So they would be engaged in order to perpetuate the idea that the market is ahistorical, they will look at history in so, order to absolutely. find it absolutely. everywhere. Absolutely, absolutely. Yes. That's absolutely the case. Um, so they have an agenda. They they kind of have. But the agenda is is about preserving the yes. Their agenda is pointed is 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 aimed at preventing systemic change. Profound systemic change, mm -hmm. whereas the socialist historian has to be the one who promotes profound systemic change, albeit over a long period of time. We're yeah. not saying revolution overnight. Yeah, yeah. So then, there's maybe two. Subtle, but there is, but, so. but 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 I come back to the point that the <clears throat> the bourgeois historian will argue for objectivity. I've got to present the facts the way they are. Right. And the social historian comes along and says, what are the a priori assumptions you make that tells you about the facts as yes. they are? I want to know those a priori assumptions because that's what defines yeah. your objectivity. Your objectivity doesn't derive from the facts. It derives from, cer derives from certain a priori assumptions you make about the world mm. that tells you what the facts are. Right. Yes. I <laughs> try this... Uh, this may too too subtle a point, but so the so we just distinguish two kinds of uh, bourgeois historians. One who one who's very aware of a certain kind of agenda, for example, to find the market everywhere and at all. I don't times. think that it's a necessarily conscious agenda. That's another point. Yeah, I think that the bourgeois historian. That's why I said, what are the a priori assumptions? Right. So there's an a priori assumption that yes, the market has always existed. Yeah. I don't yeah. have to prove it. Yeah. But that assumption means that when I look at ancient Greece or China or, or the Inuit in, 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 right. in, in Greenland 5,000 years ago, I'm going to find the market. It, it leads my, my, the, my inner eye yeah. to observe the existence of yeah. the market. Yeah. But the socialist historian comes along and says consciously. Yeah. Right. So there's, that's a big difference. Right. Yep. Which, yeah, I guess this is the point I wanted to get at. Um, it's that consciousness that the socialist historian brings that can be attacked from this uh, from this idea of objective history. Of course it can. Be, and and it so can. there's a... Right. You just have to be... So part of your point is to be clear that the uh, socialist historian, what they bring to the table, does not have to interfere with objectivity as it relates to the past. Well, I, let's play this game. Yes. I, it okay. is a game. So let's play it a little, another couple of minutes. Um. And be a little outrageous. I won't. I won't okay. deny. Um, objectivity, as we're using that term, is a characteristic, in my opinion. First of all, of the bourgeois historian, it is in in intellectual harmony with the kind of objectivity that is supposed to be characteristic of chemistry, physics mathematics, yeah, right. and so forth and so on. An, yeah. an attempt to make history scientific in that, in that peculiar way, yeah. right? Um, 
the social historian is more like, I'm, I'm, I'm exaggerating tremendously to make my point, the socialist historian is not like the theoretical physicist, but the applied physicist. Yeah. For the socialist historian, the writing of history is itself a political act aimed at a particular objective. Right. right. The socialist historian looks at the bourgeois <clears throat> historian and says, you're doing the same thing I am, but for a different purpose. Mm -hmm. You just don't recognize it. Yeah. Well, so to come back to the French so, Revolution so, as an so example. That a, so that a, a bourgeois historian undergoing historical psychoanalysis. I mean, in other words, if you had a, if yeah. you had a kind of a psychoanalyst whose job it was to make your, you as a bourgeois historian conscious of what being <laughs> right. a bourgeois historian was right. about, right. that would surface the a priori assumptions. Right. Whereas in my opinion, and it may be only city of idiosyncratic uh, from, on my part, the, the social historian is upfront about it. He says, yes, I know that's what I'm doing. Right. Yeah, so if, if we just play the game with the French Revolution as an object, right. the socialist historian says, in our ongoing search for a greater social justice, there was this event in the past, this great disruption, which was in part motivated by a search for justice itself. It was, it absolutely was. And it involved a great deal of tragedy and human suffering. Right, right. And, there, and then contrast that then with the bourgeois historian looks at the French Revolution. Well, not all. It's, as I said, it's a, it's a new, evidently newly developing school. I mean, it had its, its or just the objective one, the non-socialist one. Yeah, who says you know the, maybe the it difference? wasn't necessary in the first place if right, natural processes had been allowed. You know, people used to make this argument about the Russian Revolution. Russia would have been democratic anyway. It may have taken another few decades. Yeah. But it would have become democratic anyway, and the, the communists, the Bolsheviks, interrupted that. Right? That's this idea that 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 the that history has its own way of being. It's objective, like the market. It right. has, uh, whereas I we see, see it's descriptive yeah. laws that we have to use to. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, so I want to jump to. One of my other questions, which was, and this is again, this is a, maybe a, a subtle point, but um, you said, you talked a little bit about kind of a non-utopic future, but it does seem to me that the what the socialist historian brings to the table consciously is a search for a kind of categorically different way for human humans to relate. So in other words, if we see in the past oh, various think, yeah. configurations yeah. of power relationships, our goal is to disrupt that in some yeah. deep way. What I meant when I said, uh, uh, when I mentioned utopia is that there is that school of, uh, let, me, let, me, let me call it a sub-school of socialist theory mm -hmm. called Marxism. How's that? Okay, yes. Uh, which posits vulgar Marxism, I would add. Mm. Not just Marxism, but vulgar Marxism. Which posits a utopian society at the end of time. Uh, right? Right. So once we, we, we destroy capitalism, we pass through socialism, we arrive at communism, the sun rises every morning, yeah. boy and girl gets on tractor and rides off into the fields, making love while they're reaping the wheat to feed the workers in the city. You understand <laughs> right. my point. Yeah. Um, the true social historian now says, no, that's, that's nonsense. Of course there's no absolute future. There is a future trend. We can find other ways of human beings to relate each other, right. to each other. That does not mean that we will arrive at the end of history, yeah. which is what the vulgar Marxist, I think, does argue or used to argue. I yeah. can't imagine Many still are here. Yeah. Um, but it nonetheless projects the, a future. The future is an ongoing process, the end of which we will never reach, but the, the, the basic trends of which now, I'll go a step further, that whereas in the end of the 19th century, when people thought that progress meant more and better, that is to say, we'll have more goods, we'll have better technology, we'll so forth and so yeah. on. Today, given the ecological crisis that we face and so forth and so on, we need, to de we need to rethink what better may be. So it may well be that we need to start, we, we know that at our le present level of technology, we can't simply increase production. Mm 
So what do we need to talk about? And there is conversation going on everywhere about this now. We need to rethink the distribution of the product. In other words, we need to think about overcoming inequality. Yeah. And we need to talk about improving human relations. So that may not be the kind of progress that somebody in the 19th century, including Karl Marx, who thought capitalism was the cat's meow because it improved production and right. made more goods available. Um, it would also come to an end. Mm -hmm. uh, the point right, is yeah. that Marx understood that history yeah. didn't stand still. Nothing was a given forever. Yeah. And that's why he is sort of perhaps the greatest socialist historian. But nonetheless, we may redefine the path we're following, remap it because of the material reality changes. But nonetheless, there is a map in mm -hmm. the, to the future of goals that we would like to yeah. achieve that always will be retreating into the future, but nonetheless, we have to work toward them. Yeah. Yeah, so it occurs to me to ask, because we've been talking about theory of history, you know, fairly high-flying things, the discipline of history. It seems, you know, and here we are, this is, we are having this conversation at the end of February 2020. So the Democrats are slinging mud at each other about who's going to be the candidate. Right. And so an issue like, an issue like um, healthcare for all, I think it seems to reveal that everybody walks around with some idea about what's possible. Like it kind of has a theory of history in their head about, because with healthcare for all, you know, people will say, oh, that's, that's nice, but it's just not possible. There's not enough to go around or it could never happen. Um, all sorts of pre, pre, um, you know, things they bring to the table about how history works and what, what, what can happen in the future. Whereas there's another group of people who I think that's precisely what we If I were a professor and, yes. at a major American university. <laughs> right. Um, That'd be neat. At this particular point in time. I would think about uh, developing a course on the history of medical care delivery systems. Mm -hmm. Right. And it would be a comparative course looking at Canada, Scandinavia, so forth, and the United States. And... The purpose of the course would be to demonstrate to the students that, in fact, the ideological framework within which that discussion is taking place in our own political arena here in the United States simply is blinds us to the experience of other societies as good as our own yeah. elsewhere. Yeah. So the purpose of my history in that field would be to unmask the falsehoods which the political establishment of all stripes is putting out yeah, and to give the students a grasp of knowledge, to produce knowledge that would be useful in this argument. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Because we have many good examples of deliverable yeah. universal care. Yeah. Right? So the other another example... I was thinking of was uh, what you're saying it's about labor unions. We, if you look at the history of American labor movement, there was from about 1947 on a very concerted and successful attempt to destroy the American union movement. It's been reduced to a non, almost a non, with the exception of one or two unions, a non important. Uh, uh, element in our society now. But imagine writing the history of the union movement and, and again, putting into the students' hands the knowledge, or teaching it, right. the knowledge necessary to see that a vital labor movement was possible and therefore suggesting that it would be possible again. Yeah. So those are... That is, I'm not going to falsify history there, but the right. subject I choose and the way I outline yeah. that subject will certainly point students right. in a certain direction. Yeah, well, right. And if and, I'm honest about it, I have to tell the students that, which I will. I'll say the right. purpose of this course is to show you that, in fact, there are a lot of successful examples of medical care delivery on a universal right. scale. And here are some samples, and here's the history right. of it. Well, wouldn't it be wonderful, to speaking of the university, that rather than a class here or a class there, that the university saw it as their responsibility 
to, I mean, you know, we face an environmental crisis. We have this problem of, of race. We have the problem of healthcare. To offer a robust introduction to all of the students who come to that university, to the history and practice and future of those things. Yeah, I, I, it, I would assume that and that... And be argued in front of the students. Yeah, who, I would assume that that is the primary function of the <laughs> university, but I think... That's a past and future idea yeah, <laughs> than the a, present. But I think that's sad. precisely the point. I think we have, that's, that's why I keep saying to my friends that the American university system has failed. Yeah. You know, uh, Donald Trump, we have created Donald Trump because we have failed to educate. Uh, we, we say we're educating the future leadership of our society, but we fail to educate them in ways that make Donald Trump less likely to occur yeah. as a phenomenon. Yeah. And that's very important. We, we have neutered education from that point of view. Right. And our school systems are neutering our children intellectually that yeah. way. Well, I totally agree. Um, and I don't even think it has to be as pointedly political with Trump's name. It's just no, if, no, if no, we, I'm, I'm just, if we I'm face these agree. crises, yeah, why why aren't I agree. If you graduate from a major university, you should be well educated and but but all but, these but, things. But, but, but. Yeah. How can you teach a course on environmental policy yeah. without confronting capitalism? Private property. Oh, no, I agree. Right? Yeah. You have to be able yeah. to deal with that. Yeah. That requires what I would call a an intellectual and ideological fracture yeah. that runs in directly an opposite direction from what our contemporary American universities want, yeah. which is kind of let's all get together and we can all agree on these and we want consensus and yeah. so forth and so on. Yeah. Uh, um. There's, well, no, it's a totally inside joke, but I know of a university that has thought of its requirements. They call them uh, ways requirements. What does and, that mean? Like ways, ways of, um, ways of knowing, mm -hmm. ways of um, doing certain things. Um, and so what, we, what we're talking about is wouldn't it, wouldn't it be great if a university offered um, a requirement on ways of delivering healthcare? Yeah, <laughs> ways yeah. of dealing with race. Well, ways of knowing. <laughs> I, would, see, I would argue, and probably will in one of our conversations, that uh, that Marxism and socialism are ways of knowing yes, the world. Yeah. They're, they are intellectual tools. Right. I don't think that's what... I don't think they have in mind at all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, thanks, Big Mike. Anytime. <laughs> See you all next time. Thanks for listening to another episode of A Shareable World. To find out more about this podcast, visit us at ashareableworld.com.